All right, good afternoon, everyone. No, not sir. <laughs> Please. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us this afternoon, and thanks to many of you who are also joining us virtually. We are glad that you could make it this afternoon. Um, before I introduce our scholars who are sharing, going to be sharing their research with us today, I would like to begin by acknowledging many who made the presence of these excellent scholars on our campus possible. So the Office of the President, the Provost Office, the Department of Afro-American African Studies, Center for Global Health Equity, College of Engineering, and many colleagues who are serving as hosts and collaborators to the scholars. So we thank all of you. Uh, the plan today is to have all our three scholars make their presentation, after which there will be Q&A. So after your 20 minutes presentation, then we'll have everyone back here on the podium for Q&A. So each presenter will have 20 minutes to present their work. And for those online, please use the raise hand button to signify your intention to ask a question. And we've got someone who is going to be monitoring that. So our first presenter today is Dr. Joseph M. Sika. I'm going to introduce the three presenters all at once. Dr. Sika is from Liberia and is a lecturer and deputy director for research at the University of Liberia's Center for Teaching, Learning, and Innovation. Dr. Sika obtained a MD from Liberia's only medical school and a Master of Medical Sciences degree in global health delivery from the Harvard Medical School. Its research project focuses on increasing access to healthcare delivery, especially quality mental, mental health services using social media platforms such as WhatsApp. And Dr. Sika's presentation today is titled Addressing the Second and Third Delays using a WhatsApp referral and obstetrics triage system in Liberia. Next is Dr. Justin Nzunji from Cameroon. Dr. Nzunji is a plant biotechnologist affiliated with the University Université du Montagne in Cameroon. She received a PhD from the University of Yaoundé, also in Cameroon, and she's been involved in formulating science policies in Cameroon, as well as offering science-related advice across the continent of Africa. Dr. Nzunji's research interest lies at the intersection of science policy, STEM undergraduate education, and STEM undergraduate education in Cameroon. Our presentation today is titled, Mapping the Study of STEM Undergraduate Education in Cameroon. Our final presenter is Anne Moagi from South Africa. Anne is a PhD candidate and lecturer in international relations in the Department of Political Science at the Tabo Mbeke School of Public and International Affairs, University of South Africa, UNISA. Her research interest revolves around issues of gender, black feminist thought, youth development, race, and political philosophy. And she has widely researched and written book chapters on women's studies and African youth development issues. Our presentation is titled, Investigating Intersecting Challenges and Sexual Exploitation of Migrant Domestic Workers from Lesotho into South African Households. Please join me in welcoming all of our scholars that are presenting today. So first is Dr. Sika. Good everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Prof, for the excellent and humbling introduction. So um, in the next few minutes, I'll take you through the work that we are doing in Liberia, especially in maternal health. We have a problem 
a serious problem. Liberia uh, has a population of around 5 million people. And in 2017, it placed, it ranked ninth on the index of um, countries with higher maternal mortality. It's roughly the size of the U.S. state of Tennessee. But with that high level of maternal mortality, So this is the outline I would use for my presentation. Um, the most recent maternal mortality ratio uh, for the last health and demographic survey was even higher than the figure that is reported in 2017. It's, in 2017, it was 661 deaths per 100,000 live births. And according to the latest demographic survey, it was 742. So the problem is that too many women are dying through childbirth. And most of these deaths are preventable. We actually know how to prevent them, but yet our mothers are dying. I would like to categorize the factors responsible into two, broadly speaking. The immediate factors, that is factors that actually lead to death, and the distal factors. Uh, for the immediate factors, they are generally uh, hemorrhage or bleeding during pregnancy or after pre uh, delivery, hypertensive disorders of pregnancies where your, the blood pressure will be elevated, sepsis, unsafe abortions, and obstructed labor. For the most part, those are the leading causes of immediate maternal death. The distant causes can be explained in terms of the three delay model. And that model posits that there could be a delay in the decision in seeking health care that lies at the community with the person. There could be a delay in reaching the health facility or an adequately resourced health facility. And the, there could also be a delay in receiving health care once at the facility. Our interventions are targeted at the two delays, which we refer to as the second and third delay. That is the delay in getting to the health facility and the delay in being provided adequate and quality health care. Our intervention uses two simple tools the WhatsApp platform, which we use to facilitate referrals. So we have a referral group with 20 health, rural health facilities that are within communication network and two referral hospitals in central Liberia in a county called Bunk County. 
community health volunteers or community health assistants, which we call CHAs, are connected in the, with the health, with their respective health facilities. And health facilities are connected separately to the two hospitals. So ideally, we expect referral to originate from the community. Community health assistant will alert the midwife at the rural health facility that I've seen this patient with danger sign, and we label the danger signs of pregnancies which they watch out for, which will require referral. So the CHA is a simple message to the rural health facility. It enables the midwife to prepare ahead of time to receive that patient. If the midwife cannot handle the case, then the midwife alerts the, one of the referral hospitals that I'm sending patient A, B because of these conditions. And that simple message of alerting the midwife either at the rural health facility or at the referral hospitals will be sufficient to save time and to allow them to prepare. So these interventions have been used elsewhere in similar settings, but they've been used separately. We are the first in Liberia to combine both the WhatsApp platform and midwife-led obstetrics triaging. That's the innovation part of it. Ours is a quasi-experimental design in which, among other things, we've collected structural observation on the labor and delivery world. What that means is that we've hired research assistants who we observe the labor and delivery process from the beginning, from the time the pregnant woman enters the world to the time delivery occurs. And we've done that at, our, our intention is to do it at three different intervals. A midline data collection, a baseline first, a midline, and an end line. And during those processes, each of them will collect 50 uh, set of observations from the hospitals. What we intend to do with that data is to measure waiting times and other indicators that will speak to the fidelity of implementation. We also conducted an OB triage training. We did a pretest and a post-test. What the pretest showed us was that there were deficits in knowledge of triaging amongst midwives. And we did a two-day training course after which we administered a post-test, uh, which results I will also be sharing later on. So the overall objective of the intervention is to increase timely health care seeking along the referral pathway for pregnant women, and also to establish a midwife-led triage system to increase the quality and safety of cesarean sections. The whole concept of triage um, is rooted in war medicine. And at that time, the whole idea was that um, as much as possible to save those who 
were at the brink of death and to leave those who were dying to die. Uh, Modern medicine has changed that, and we now tend to concentrate on the most critical patients, prioritize the most critical patients, and try to save their lives. And the whole idea was to be able to prioritize in using scarce resources at that time. It is still also relevant to try to prioritize in saving the most critical life even now. So the variables of interest that we've been collecting include a time-stamped WhatsApp message. Uh, whenever the WhatsApp platform is used for messaging, the time that the message is sent is recorded automatically. And so that time will be noted. And the time that the patient arrives at the hospital, the midwife is also supposed to acknowledge receipt or acknowledge that the patient, the pregnant woman, has arrived. And those two times are recorded. So time stamps, WhatsApp messages. Uh, we also did collect information on triage knowledge through our pre and post test outcomes. We also note maternal and neonatal outcomes, the number of cesarean sections that are performed, and we intend to collect uh, satisfaction data also from both uh, the providers and from women that have been referred through the system. We also intend to determine case fatality rates and of course, use the observation data to assess whether um, risk assessment and treatment plan were carried out according to standard protocol. So this is what the typical message looks like. Uh, we have unique ID assigned to the providers, and they would just write that they are sending, they only use the initials of the patient, they indicate the reason for referral, the time of referral. They will provide additional information whether the patient is a previous cesarean section patient. They will indicate the gestational age if they are able to determine that. And later on, we added mode of transport because um, transport is not always by ambulance. Sometimes patients have to provide their own transportation when they are referred. So we also are interested in that variable. In the triaging aspect, we use wristband according to these three classifications. If the patient meets any of those in red, they will, be, they will wear a red wristband. Or those in yellow, they will be given a yellow wristband. And if it's just a normal patient after assessment, they will be given a green wristband. The thing is that once you wear a rare wristband, it remains on your wrist until you are delivered safely and discharged. So you can move from green to yellow and red, but you cannot move from red to yellow or green during your stay in the hospital because once you are classified as red, your risk still remains high, and you should be prioritized by the attending uh, providers. After the pre-test, we found that main test scores were, pre-test main test scores were 59, and post-test main scores 79.6 following the two-day training. Our model that we used was a train the trainer. So we trained initially five persons, and those five persons in turn roll out the training to the other providers. We intend to collect median wait times data, 
We've already started collecting those, but uh, proper analysis will be done after collection of the end line data. For the next steps will be finalization of data collection, which is in process. We'll conduct the satisfaction survey among three groups of participants. We analyze the caesarean section data using Robson classification. Robson, Robson classification is a 10-tier classification that looks at reasons for the caesarean section. Um, according to the World Health Organization, caesarean section rate should be between 5% to 15%. Liberia's rate is around 4% of total cesarean sections. So we want to know whether, um, I mean, you, you cannot per se target, but reasonably you should fall, your country data should fall between those extreme. Um, I would like to acknowledge the peer grant, which is a USAID sponsored uh, grant the Bill and Melina Gates Foundation for providing funding for our studies. Professor Jody Aro Laurie, my UMAP, my University of Michigan host, Prof. Bernie Steve Dine, who has graciously permitted me to be a part of this prestigious uh, fellowship, the Ministry of Health of Liberia and Bonn County the African Studies Center, and the University of Michigan, generally. Thank you. Next is Prof. Justine Nzonji. Thank you, Prof. I don't know if it's working. So I have to touch here, right? Oh, this to the left. Okay. 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 Thank you so much, Prof, for giving me the floor. I'm very happy to be here, and I want to seize this opportunity to thank the Africa Study Center staff, my host, my administration back home, my mate of the same cohort, and your friend. You are making my stay here memorable. Thank you. <laughs> I have to present today. My topic is a little special because today is special. I have to present mapping undergraduate STEM education in Cameroon. So I'll start by presenting Cameroon. It's the one of the most beautiful and diverse country in Africa. <laughs> it's called Camero, Africa in miniature because of the diversity of geography, climate, like demography. Um, languages, actually we have about 300 local languages and also a lot of natural resources. We are actually part of the Congo Basin Forest which is the second length of the world because of the ability to release the oxygen in the environment. So we have also a lot of culture and, and tribe. Here we, you have a, an outfit from Cameroon. It's called Togo. We use it usually during uh, like ceremony, traditional one, national or international. So if you see someone with this dress, know that he's a Cameroonian. Oh, he love Cameroon. Oh, I don't know why he's wearing it. <laughs> so in Cameroon, I start my journey as a, in research as plant biotechnologist, working with medicinal plant. So um, working to improve the production, the conservation, and the domestication of medicinal plant, meaning bringing them from their natural environment, which could be the forest or the farm, to the close environment, the lab, or the greenhouse teaching student, undergraduate and graduate student. Quite exciting, I'm still doing it now. And uh, 
<laughs> from undergraduate study to postgraduate study in Cameroon, there's a lot of research work in the research center at the university, but there's still a gap between what the science or research can offer and the socio-economic development of the country. That's why I come my interest on science policy. So with the challenge the world is facing today, like climate change, health pollution, water pollution, uh, health issue like COVID-19 pandemic, scientific evidence-based solution is becoming more and more relevant. You have one side, like science, university, research council, uh, research institute. On the other side, we have the government, we have policy maker, we have decision maker. In between, there is a bridge. It's science police expert with the job to use their talent to translate the exoteric or higher technical scientific issue to be able to solve them in good policy. So some just define science policy as policy for science, like improve policies that can enable the flourishing of science, or I define it as science for policy, like improve development of policies that can benefit from advanced scientific insights. Some just define science policy as a part of the public policy, which deal with the policy towards science issue or research enterprise in terms of like funding, resources, infrastructure, legislation, education also. So this domain is very broad. And what I have to do in this research is to try to bring some scientific evidence to the government, to the policymaker, in such a way that they could improve the STEM education, the education in Cameroon, especially STEM education, and particularly undergraduate STEM. There are some facts that it's about, at the sub-regional level, 70 years now, that country in the Central Africa, sharing the same currency, decided to uniformize the education, higher education system. So Cameroon was able then to join the other country, the Central Africa, to have the same level of evaluation. Then it was an opportunity to Cameroon to be able to uniformize his local education system, previously made of francophone education and anglophone education. So, why STEM? Why undergraduate study? I'll start by STEM. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This word was created in 2001 by scientific administrators at National Science Foundation in US. It had been spread all over the world. Some call it STI, Science, Technology, Information. And there are many facts that are linked to, 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 to STEM. For example, one of the greatest strengths strength of developed country is their capacity to invest on STEM. Their capacity to attract global talent on STEM to develop their economy and reinforce their technology competitiveness. When it comes to Africa, Africa falls behind compared to the rest of the world. That's why, for example, there are some statistics from Africa Bank Development which show that less than 25% of students of higher education in Africa choose STEM. It means that more than 75% choose, choose a science or uh, humanities. So there is really a gap. When it comes to Cameroon, Cameroon has the vision to be emerging in 2035. And each 10 years, they put in place a strategic document. For this, uh, for this moment, the strategic document emphasizes in one point, which is the structural transformation of the economy and to, to transform the economy, they focus on nine main points, which is energy, talking about electricity, agro-industry, digital, timbers, all those domains, they need absolutely STEM expertise. Not rely on STEM expatriate expertise as it used to be because it's more expensive to add value to those natural resources that we have. To process, to export, we need absolutely to build our STEM workforce. So, why undergraduate st study? In Cameroon, the majority of higher education students are undergraduate students. It's kind of pyramid with a very broad base. 
with undergraduate students, like something like that. <laughs> and the, the majority of workforce in Cameroon is made of undergraduate students. You can find them in all sectors of activities. Like a, an undergraduate student in math and physics can work easily at the bank than a PhD student in math and physics because he needs to have a job directly related to what he has done. Yes. And also, an important point is to have the quality of graduate student, we need to have the quality of undergraduate student. This is a class in Cameroon. We took the picture one week ago, second year, the main university and the first university in Cameroon in terms of construction, the number, infrastructure. And the problem I want us to see here is the, the infrastructure problem and the ratio like teacher, student. Um, when I came here, uh, my host told me he's a math prof and his class has like 15 or maximum 25 students. I was asking myself, how can a student in Cameroon compete with a student in US? That's why we, we, are, we are thinking through this project, try to bring some facts that will help to address that. When we look at the enrollment percentage of students in Cameroon, it grew year after year. But in 2016, there was a peak. This is due to the crisis the country is facing now. Between two regions, there was a drop of, of school in two regions. But this number started increasing. And uh, from 2012, 2020, in 2021, there were 35,000 new students in Cameroon. And if we have to rely on the statistic of African Development Mark, we say that less than 25,000 to STEM, it means that less than 9,000 over 35,000 to STEM education. So the, the, the gap is really big. Another problem that I can point is like brain drain. Students at undergraduate level or graduate students in Cameroon usually go abroad to study. Then they work for company abroad, which take advantage, it's a way of saying it, of their expertise. And uh, also those companies sometimes compete with the local company. I just want to share with you some uh, destination of Cameroon students abroad, mostly in Europe, then North America, then Africa and Turkey. Um, there is also a point about the insertion rate, the insertion rate in Cameroon. So um, it's about 75%, mostly from engineering or medical related school. And the question is, how many times it takes them to find a job? First, second thing, are the job related to what they have learned in school? So. These are some questions will help us in our work. And we'll say, OK, let us, don't, let us reflect. And so we are trying to then identify all graduate field um, subject practice policy of, in Cameroon. So we send also a survey to students. The survey is to have your, their perception, their motivation, their challenge. A survey to lecturer also to see how they are shaping their curricula, how did they like, translate it to students, what is the challenge, how they think we can do better, which one fit better with the, with, the work, with, the, with, with the work environment. Then we have an online workshop with the different stakeholders in charge of education, especially higher education in Cameroon. Next month, actually, we will with them, we will have to gather a lot of information that could help us orient the decision, identify strategy to improve the alignment of STEM education in Cameroon with the, with, with the job, and then to see if it fit the reality of workforce landscape. Then we have an in-person conference in Cameroon also, which is kind of feedback of the research that we do here and then uh, try also to have more information and see how we can investigate new way of doing education in Cameroon, new initiative of doing education in Cameroon and put a place, 
a plan of implementation of the research. Then we have to correlate all the study that we've done. We know we gather a lot of information and our role is to be able to make it simple uh, from that complex of data you, you, you will receive. Uh, it's the role also of the science expert. Sometimes people call it an art because be able to speak to different targets and keep the genuity of the data is an art also. So at the end, we'll be able then to translate all those information through a report and policy brief, first to the Economical and Social Council of the country. It's, um, it's a consultative organism in, Cam in Cameroon, the fourth one actually in charge of advise the government on the economic and social policy. The ministry in charge of education, the ministry in charge of research, UNESCO and other organizations that, uh, that support um, education. Groupema Interpatronal du Cameroon is the patron of uh, like private industry in Cameroon to see how they can open up to STEM education for undergraduate students and then to, to the university. And this will be all I have to do after the project. But there is something also which kind of perspective of the work, which is a workshop with parliamentarians in Central Africa. Actually, from this work, we will write a case study. It will be the second uh, workshop we will be organizing on science advice. The first time was through the governor. When I say we, it's actually the Cameroon Academy of Young Scientists, which I'm a member, I'm the president. So it will be the second edition of the workshop of science advice towards the parliamentarian. Why the parliamentarian? Because they are the one voting the law. They are the one allocating the budget to a specific area in Cameroon. So we have two case studies there. Like Boya Protocol is a type of convention to of equitable sharing of exploitation, exploitation of natural resources. It's really common in Central Africa. A lot of resources sometimes, the population don't benefit that. So we have a case study on Agoya Protocol and not that case study on STEM uh, education. The project is taking shape because next month we, we will present the state of advancement of this project to one of the partners of the project in Canada, Le Fonds de Recherche du Québec, the organization in charge of funding the research in Quebec. So we really hope that at the end of this project, the government will hear that the education system in Cameroon will improve years after, a year after years and be a kind of proud like this. <laughs> Elif Kijoke, this champion who is proudly represents uh, Kenya and Africa all over the world. And we really wish that he used to beat his own record that the education system in Cameroon and maybe in Africa beat is on record. Thank you so much. You. Okay, next is uh, Anne Moagi. Thank you so much, Paul. You're welcome. that um, I'm also a member of the Department of Political Science at the University of South Africa. Uh, so now it's obvious that I'm actually, I actually have two jobs. So um, my project is actually a PhD project and um, one of the interest for me was actually to study myself as a black woman at the, in South Africa. So it was influenced by the idea that we had so many experiences when it comes to apartheid and segregation and also representation of black women in South Africa. So it's actually titled Intersecting Challenges and Sexual Expectations of Domestic Workers um, who are from Lesotho into South African household. And I'll be utilizing the theory of intersectionality um, 
to theorize their experiences within gender studies perspective. So to start briefly, I wanted to actually bring in the identity of uh, Sarki Batman, which also influenced a lot of my research when it comes to black feminism. Um, Sarki, ba Sarki Batman was actually one of the examples of um, the first sexually trafficked um, a woman of, of color in South Africa, particularly during the 19th century. And uh, to that extent that she had to be, uh, she died actually where she, she was, uh, where she was in France. And um, she had to actually be reburied back in South Africa in 2002. So uh, Sariki Bartman's um, identity is that she was actually one of the sexually objectified um, uh, person in South, South Africa. And also it actually enforced um, um, it, it forced a white supremacist power structure as she was actually groomed to be an object of, object of European sexual fasc fascination. She was also seen as a servant only to serve the pleasure of white men and to further undermine and exploit black femininity as a symbol of oppression and sexual terrorism. So which also further that we see that actually will be unfolding when we speak about migration narrative directed towards images of black females as domestic workers in South Africa. The other image that also um, has an influence in my research study is the African-American, uh, the Mammy. So basically the Mammy uh, has a direct emphasis on the study because of this figure also shares the similar characteristics of Sarah Batman. Being a black woman, in particular her role um, uh, as a breadwinner, mother and protector of the family. This perennial um, stereotype image of a black woman um, as a Negro slave mother perpetuated by the white chauvinist ideology that Negro women are backward, inferior, and natural slaves of others. <coughs> so the Mammy stereotypes were created as an overgeneralization of black women, um, were actually meant to further dehumanize the black culture. Um, the Mammy was also categorized as a black woman who's also asexual, trustworthy to an extent, and caring, caring for the white children of, and, and at the expense of her own family responsibilities. So as part of my research, I have so many concepts, a few concepts that I'll be actually focusing on. And one of those concepts will be um, obviously discuss our apartment, the Mammy and the kitchens. The kitchens is actually one of the main terms that is currently being used post apartheid in South Africa, whereby it actually um, demonstrates how um, black women were actually uh, working as domestic workers into, into white families. And the rhetoric of that is that um, the rhetoric of that is that it actually brings in a perspective of the sociolo sociological structure and the political structure of referring to a black woman who work away from their home in urban cities, particularly those urban cities where um, actually modern and economically developed. So the term kitchens is still widely used now, even in South Africa, whereby firstly the woman or the individual will res semi permanently reside in the premises of the white family. Secondly, will work for a white um, family or a business. And thirdly, it will demonstrate an urban type of exploitation inside the master's house. So Sheila's day um, also resonates with this study is because of it was widely known during the apartheid system, that during the apartheid years in South Africa from 1948 onwards, whereby every black woman who used to work in the families of the white, um, of the white employ, 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 employers was actually referred to as Sheila. They were saying that because of they could not pronounce the name of the black female who was working in their homes. So it resonated actually predominantly on every Thursday because of in South Africa, every Thursday is actually seen as um, a day of prayers for, for women. So many women who are domestic workers will actually go and sit uh, by the nearest park and actually during those meetings, they will possibly learn about um, their desires and hopes and their beliefs. And also they would also talk about um, catching up with any, any news about um, back home because of they actually had left their villages and to go and work in those um, urban areas. And the term feminism, I'm obviously going to be using as a background of the study 
because of in this lens, I truly believe that um, it will provide a feminist point of view in, to argue that how conscious are the, their lived experiences of these domestic workers in order for them to improve uh, their, themselves productivity and also their financial performance as part of, uh, because of their are uh, actually a marginalized group and how they can be able to advocate for their own positions and human rights. So obviously some of my main concepts that I'm using is um, obviously the apartheid. The apartheid historical concept is that South Africa has actually experienced a lot of segregation policies and one of the main focus for my research that I'm going to be using um, is actually, I, I'm only going to pick a few um, segregation policies and one of those segregation policies is actually the Urban Areas Act and how does it resonate with my study on migration is that and black female domestic workers is that um, um, actually under several past laws like the Urban Areas Act of 1923 black women were actually restricted to exercise their rights they had to actually carry something called a pass which is almost something like like this um, I actually hope that I don't miss it uh, or else I won't be able to go back home but it's, it was actually some sort of like a booklet that it was supposed to actually carry in order for, for them to actually enter into an urban area. Um, and also the native, um, one of the laws is the Native, um, the native Act of 1950, 1950, 1952, which also actually regulated the movement of African blacks, non-Europeans obviously into urban areas, including forcing black people to always carry identification with them so that actually restricting their entry into specific white towns or areas and also forcing black people to settle in specific places in order to provide for white farmers or white businesses for a steady source of labor. Um, as part of my study, I'm also going to looking, be looking at um, the colonialism or the colonial structure, uh, which actually forms part of the study because of um, the issue of historical migration in Southern Africa has actually witnessed colonial disposition because of the oppression and demarcation made by the oppressor, obviously, and colonialists in Africa. It also provides an important historical context and overview of how colonialism has had an impact on migration that led to a predominance of black women um, in servitude across the globe. So also this African historical narrative alludes that structural constraints from the pre-colonial and colonial areas continue to prevent the elimination of discrimination against women. So I'm also going to be looking at uh, the gender relations, gender relations in post-apartheid apartheid, apartheid and also critical race theory. The B, E, E, triple B, the triple B and E is called uh, Black Business Empowerment and Affirmative Action, which is now being actually introduced by the current South African government to in, in order to create representation and to empower uh, the previously disadvantaged groups, which I'll also be discussing in my research. The idea of uh, structural violence is that, um, which was actually conceptualized by Johan Galtang, is that actually is to try to understand the existing theories within the societies due to societal conditions. So structural violence says that there are always ways in which people were maternally damaged through poverty and deprivation under capitalism. As opposed, through, as opposed through international individual action and thus familiarizing themselves within their circumstances as, as, as though it is normal. So how does psychological trauma affect my research study? It affects the research study because of this um, experience of segregation from an apartheid system which actually left many psychological trauma, which is detrimental to the so social sciences and in the level of psychological trauma experienced by black women during apartheid and how their gender relations have caused furthermore conflict regarding their relationship with their families. Apartheid actually dismantled the existing family structures in South Africa. And this research will also demonstrate the level of impact and the triple effect it has had on the current middle class black bourgeoisie in South Africa, families who actually employ these domestic workers. So I'll also briefly look at the 1956 march, which happened um, in South Africa, um, where it was about 2,000 women who participated in this march. Um, it was led by um, it was led by different women. I quickly wanted to show you. So this is actually 
one of the one of the um, the demonstration. It was actually in 1956. In this uh, in this um, march, um, it was actually a group of um, organized um, women of different colors or racial groups, but predominantly it was about black women. Uh, were not actually allowed to live in towns unless they had a permission to be employed there and extending these past laws which made them also more difficult for women and their children to join their husbands in the towns. So this was actually against, uh, they presented, if they were carrying there, they presented um, a petition um, to the government stating that they don't want to be, to carry those passes anymore. So how does my study I quickly just want to go back to, sorry, uh, is it, did it go back? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I quickly want to go back to my other concept of um, uh, intersectionality um, regarding migration in Southern Africa because of Lesotho is part of the Sadek region as well as South Africa. So intersectionality is actually coined by Kimberly Kirscher, which is one of my um, authors that I'll be using, confronting intersectionality uh, as part of identity politics and gender interaction that draws on multiple, um, of multiple uh, black women's experiences and their, and their lived experiences regarding discrimination and prejudice. So basically interse intersectionality will help us theorize the gender roles regarding various forms of sub uh, subordination they have experienced meaningfully and how Lesotho women in South, Af South Africa are experiencing their sexual identity and also treating gender mainstreaming dynamics and the, how they are marginalized as, as a group. So in terms of, um, I'll also be looking at certain elements of uh, sexual exploitation, their human rights and also their health rights because there's actually a widespread perception in South Africa that migrant domestic workers from Lesotho are available for sexual exploitations by their employers. This research will also draw on uh, the real condition that these domestic workers are from Lesotho that are experiencing, which is limited to sexual exploitation, human trafficking, discrimination, and also the difficult employment challenges that they face in terms of wage wages and also their status as migrants working in South Africa under so many circumstances. So I'll also be looking at the South African labor system. So actually in this section, I will have a broader discussion relating to the historical labor system in South Africa, further discussing the rise of the middle, middle class uh, blacks, which are actually predominantly known as the black bourgeoisie. So I will also discuss how the labor force was used to exploit the black women to work in white areas for white families leaving their families behind and the balance of economic inequality um, onto um, the pillars of uh, economic inequality with the exploitation of labor under the apartheid political system, it further normalized w low wages of many black people who were under the Yaru. And also why should we study the economic history of South Africa during apartheid? It's arguably, arguably because of the, this is a major reason that we, we see the level of exploitation that is still currently continuing, um, which is under cheap labor and is also created a triple down effect of what we currently see in post apartheid South Africa and is being normalized by exploiting skilled laborers, especially those ones who are immigrants from other African countries. So since the focus of the research is actually domestic work, this study is also motivated by the belief that there's actually room in research on gender identity and challenges of sexual exploitation. Uh, of migrant domestic workers into South African homes. Some of these domestic workers are women who depart their homes to find work in South Africa and actually predominantly in black families and also including how they negotiate their social spaces in order to find employment within households and to survive in a foreign land. I'll also be analyzing the Immigration Act of South Africa number 13 of 2002 um, in this regard is because of there is also the different types of permits that come into that that come into into play when it comes to attaining uh, work in South Africa so the immigration act of 13 of 2002 describes the different types of categories of immigrant immigration process in South Africa on the other hand the document also allows for the Department of Labor to also scrutinize and accept different types of working permits and unfortunately um, 
domestic work is not part of those working permits that should be given in South Africa. So in terms of the middle class uh, bourgeoisie, that is going to be the focus area. That's the area where I'm going to be uh, looking at those um, family households. Because of the middle class in South Africa, the black middle class in South Africa is actually increasing rapidly. And that um, they're actually, um, the, 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 um, which is classified as previously disadvantaged groups, PDG, and um, under the apartheid system who were actually oppressed economically and socially in the country are now finding redress under the new government led by the African National Congress. So this group is now predominantly African and black, obviously, and that um, they are, is, is part of actually allowing them to access employment, education, higher education, it, uh, participate within the economy and also development program within the trans transformation platform and allowing for a close gap created so that, 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 that was created by the segregation policy by the apartheid government. So it also to create economic opportunities for access to resources and for it to be actually equally distributed between the black and the whites. Um, so this is just one of the examples. One of the main um, book that I'm actually going to be, that, I, that is part of this research project is actually Madam and Maids, which was one of the books that was written uh, by Jacqueline Cook um, that is, describes the politics and oppression of how domestic work was being used as a tool in Southern Africa for them to actually exploit black women. So in terms of migration in Southern Africa, looking at Lesotho, why Lesotho? The reason is that Lesotho is a kingdom or rather a monarch uh, and it has a democratic, democratic system of governance. So Lesotho is also part of the Southern African Customs Union. The relationship between Lesotho and South Africa dates back to 1988 to 1989 regarding the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which is one of, South, which is one of Africa's actually largest hydroelectric project and supply of water to South Africa. This is an example that both countries are dependent on each other and that the Lesotho uh, Highlands Water Project supplies, uh, supplies water to many South African homes and it has actually um, we also discovered that Lesotho has the capacity to capture more rainfall than South Africa. That's one of the reasons why South Africa is also investing in these projects. The issue of migration in Southern Africa um, so this is the geographical, geographical map of where South Africa, uh, Lesotho is in Southern Africa, it's actually in the east of South, uh, Southern Africa. So, um, so that is um, Lesotho, I don't know where is the pointer, is it the pointer? Yes, that's Lesotho over there and obviously that is part of South Africa. So why migration in South Africa is because of both countries share a history of migration dating back from as early as 1948 or before that, but obviously for, for record, I'm going to start my research between 1948 until current regarding mining and agricultural production, which was growing back then um, uh, from the 1948 and also how the apartheid capitalist system profited immensely from the cheap labor uh, from mining industries where immigrants were lured to provinces such as Gauteng, which is um, here, Gauteng, a free state, which is just below Lesotho over here, and um, the Transvaal, which is predominantly this, this area. So it benefited a lot from the mining industry and the labor from, um, uh, from the migrants who were predominantly from Lesotho who were migrating to this part of Southern Africa. So I'll be discussing actually um, docu both documented and undocumented Im immigrants. It's unfortunate that we do not have enough st statistics related to how many migrant um, domestic, um, sorry, how, ma how many immigrants are actually recorded who are documented in South Africa. The latest one that we do, that we do have is this, this one dates back between 2016 so to 2021, but it's also really not quite correct. So GP actually represents um, Gauteng, the Gauteng province. There you can see these are actually the migrants that are coming into, um, in, into that province. And also the highest is the Western Cape and um, the, North, the Northwest, which is their number right there, and then Bumalanga. But for the, part, for the purpose of this research, I'm only going to be focusing on three provinces, which is Gauteng, the Free State and um, Houting and the Free State 
The reason is because of, if we go back to the slide, um, it's because of the free state is, is an entry point to, which is here, is an entry point for Lesotho domestic workers into South Africa. And Gauteng is because of, it's one of the major hubs of um, the economic hub of South Africa. So um, I'm going to be looking at other main topics such as, um, do we call them aliens or are they uh, immig um, illegal, immigrants, aliens, illegal or legal immigrants? And one of these reasons is because of, I am actually um, intrigued by the, the pragmatic truth regarding this illegal or legal migration topic which is also a very sensitive topic in terms of political sciences and also in migration studies. It's because of, um, as I find it to be actually quite conflicting in, in how we express the sentiments in African narrative um, of the person being an, an alien, um, which allows us to draw on the concept of Ubuntu, um, which I, I'm going to be discussing that also as part of my research because in the core fundamental notion behind Ubuntu, it is a belief that we actually exist within a collective, right? And, and that we cannot claim to be actually an individual within a collective. So Ubuntu Obutu, okay. So Ubuntu Obutu is widely referred to in a South Africa, Southern African community as a humanism, which, is, which says that I am because we are. So these ideals are actually quite profound in the study of migration movement as it springs from what we could pro pro proclaim as or should go beyond migration in, in terms of um, who should we be excluding when we talk about migration and when you talk about individual being an illegal immigrant in an African continent or in a country in an African continent. So I'll also be discussing the issues of um, different types of uh, permit that actually the Department of Labor in South Africa is actually responsible for handing out the, um, the, the permits for domestic work at different types of um, employment statuses in South Africa. And unfortunately, domestic work is not actually one of the, um, uh, the, the one was not actually one which is listed as part of um, uh, a status in the country. So my research methodology, I'm going to be using interviews, qualitative method, and the demography will be black female domestic workers who are from Lesotho. And I'll be conducting my research in Lesotho, in Maseru, and Bluefoot in South Africa, and also in Gauteng. And also I'll be interviewing the Southern African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union in terms of other issues that might relate that we are not familiar with regarding how they're going to be enforcing that domestic workers can be, um, can have a status and work permits in South Africa. So to conclude, I would like to say thank you so much and to my professor, Professor Deja Brain in South Africa, who's in the Department of English Studies, and to Professor uh, Raven Jimenez, who is uh, part of the Department of History here at the, at the, U, at, U, uh, um, at the University of Michigan, who actually helped, assisted me a lot to conceptualize my research project. And also everyone at home who has been really much supportive of my research. And I hope that um, once I've collected all my data, I would come back and present my research findings. Thank you so much. Okay, let me just take that. Uh, we'd like to invite uh, Justin, Joseph, and Anna to the podium. Okay, so we can take your questions. And Lade, since we are on Zoom, people need to use the microphone so that our Zoom audience can hear. So if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, the microphone will come to you. Okay, and please introduce yourself before you ask your question. Who wants to go first? 
Samuel. Um, uh, I hope we have, please, do we have a specific number of questions we can ask? Yes, ask any of the panelists. Then because I have are. questions for most everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah um, my first question um, for, sorry, um, Samuel Boahim. Yes, one of the UMAP scholars. Thank you. My first question, Siaka. Um, I think the the is an interesting one. Um, issues of maternal um, death is is quite sensitive and critical. Um, if you've been to the labor world before, you understand what I'm saying. It's it's not an easy thing. So I appreciate the use of the WhatsApp platform for some of these things. Um, I was thinking, won't it, because the study area I remember is in the, in the is it the Bongo County? Yeah. Um, and it's, that is not the only place in uh, Liberia that would have this problem. I understand it's a study area. But to have um, a more robust system for the health care of, of um, uh, pregnant women in the country. Um, if we are able to use the WhatsApp system, then it means that these places kind of have some internet access. And so um, it won't be difficult integrating everybody in the country of a sort to it. Will it be possible to rather look at designing um, some system that will serve as a digital referral system for all hospitals in Liberia, so that it will not just be the WhatsApp system for only a specified few, but everybody in Liberia can go onto the system, make referrals, and any hospital nearby can check the referral all over the country and, and, and get a result of a sort. Thank you. OK, so next question. Yes. Good evening. My name is Uguchi one of the OMAP scholars. Mm, my question is also for Joseph. <coughs> um, five million in Liberia, that's quite a small number compared to 200 in Nigeria. So 200 million in Nigeria. So I'm sure your app will work well. I saw you mentioned about wristband with different colors. I was just thinking, the wristband is it being used manually? Is there no way that wristband could have a sensor so that uh, um, the idea of moving somebody from one color to the other can also change why the person is wearing it? Because at times, maybe the attendants might not really know when somebody has changed from one particular situation to the other. If that could be you know, maybe a further work people can do so that the wristband will have a sort of a sensor. Then um, that's for Joseph. Should I ask for yes, the other Yes, please ask others. Okay. Um, for Justin, um, my question is on the um, STEM, STEM thing, are you looking at only, wouldn't it be good, because these days when we talk about STEM, we always look at female, because mostly females are the ones that are not involved in STEM um, um, courses, mostly in all over the world. So maybe if you also look at how female um, girl child can be involved in STEM courses more, in your policy so that you add it. It will not just be, because it will also get the attention of the policy makers. Then for uh, um, Anne, without an E, uh, is it, okay, yes, without an E, yes. Yeah. So your, <laughs> your topic is very interesting. I was just telling the people beside me, those stories make me sad. Mm. Yeah, I, I, it makes me very, very sad. But my question is, what do you want to derive at the end of your project? You want to create awareness? 
or are there policies that need to be put in place to stop it? Has it stopped or is it still ongoing? Thank you. All right, so uh, why don't you respond one minute each. We start with uh, Anna and we come this way. Then we'll take next round of questions. Thank you so much for the question. I think what is important for me is that I've identified the, so many elements of stereotypes that are being perpetuated towards black female bodies. And having discussed the history of Sarah Batman and the Mammy, it's one of those indications that those um, identities have been perpetuated from historically and be also being embedded with the current narratives that we're also seeing, also through the apartheid system, also through media that we see black women's bodies have been perpetuated as sexualized. So what we see emanating now in, Southern, in, South, in South Africa is that the stereotypes are also being perpetuated now to the closest individuals or to the closest group which are vulnerable and those group, that group is actually domestic workers who are from particularly different African countries. I mentioned Lesotho because of um, Lesotho, the reason why I selected Lesotho is because of Lesotho has some sort of connection with South Africa in terms of language, culture, and also um, it's within South Africa. So in some sense that when domestic workers, it's quite easier for them to actually connect with the communities in South Africa and working within those families. So what I would actually like to uh, make emphasis regarding my research is the ideas of representations of black women that we are not black women are not only limited to particular images or else we'll see that being perpetuated in our society in our public spaces in our private spaces including the corporate spaces where only the where black women will be limited to particular images so that is what I would like to see for us to be able to interrogate that our lived experiences and the trauma that um, uh, historically has been embedded through the, through the history of uh, segregation, through the history of limiting black women into particular spaces, they should not be perpetuated in our society. Thank you. Justin? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ogoshi. Um, concerning the work we are doing, actually, uh, th there, will, there will be some statistic of women when we have to do with uh, like quantitative data. But our focus more is to show that to the policymaker that if the Cameroon needs to be emerging in 2035, 35, as they mentioned, they, have ab they absolutely need to invest on STEM. The main workforce actually is undergraduate student and they need to invest in terms of resources, in terms of infrastructure to build the quality of, quality of manpower will be able to work to those nine domains that we want, the one for the structural development, economic structural development of the country. So there are some work we are doing maybe in parallel to sensitize more women in STEM education. But this work has a specific focus to help them know that the best way to like to be developed is to invest in infrastructure and resources for undergraduate students. Thank you. Joseph? Yes, okay, thank you for those two questions. Uh, the first one concerns uh, digitalization of referrals. So the WhatsApp platform is a pilot yet, but we are also working with our colleagues from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and we are thinking about uh, in the next steps to see whether we can create an app and what the app would do is that we will customize um, some of the tools and put it on the app so that when somebody is referred, the people at the referral hospital, just by looking at the tablet, will know some detailed preliminary assessment that that person is coming with. We, um, when we're at the Center for Global Health recently, we're discussing that and somebody was pointing out the challenge or the challenges with uh, app-based uh, tools, but we, this is something that we intend to elevate to the next level. And concerning the wristband, we know that um, 
Human beings are visual, you know, people. And so that's just the purpose that we've already done our triaging and classified our patients based on the risk that they have, right? So that is the idea of using wristband is just to color, to show color so that if somebody else is coming to take over duties, they know that once I see red, I need to prioritize. But the whole idea is that people are continuously assessed. It's not a one-time assessment. That's not what triage is. So you need to assess them and further reclassify them as need-based. So it's just a simple uh, thing. I don't know what additional benefits sensors would do, but those are things that we could look at in the, in the future too. All right, thank Especially you. Especially from AI person. Okay. Thank you. We'll take up the next set of questions. Are there questions online uh, right Yeah, now? so I want to remind our participants on Zoom, you can also ask a question by using the raise your hand function or if you have a, not in a space that's wide enough to sp pronounce your question, speak your question, you can type it and, and we can read the question to the audience member. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nahago, uh, a UMAP scholar. My question is to Dr. Siaka. Um, I know maternal health and childbirth uh, mortality, it's, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge actually in, uh, in Africa. And Liberia has that, and by your research, I think you are trying to come out with this um, semiotic color codes to help um, reduce some of these challenges. Um, my question is, in your research, have you considered um, other variables that may affect delay in transporting um, women, pregnant women, to the facilities in relation to uh, road and then uh, vehicle, vehicles or maybe traffic situations, um, things that may impede the safe transportation of <coughs> women to centers and also availability of healthcare facilities to intervene. Thank you. Nesta? Yes, um, Dr. Justine. Um, for me, when, before I go to um, the university, the only science-oriented program I knew was medicine and mechanical engineering. The, the knowledge of STEM at the high school level at the time was very low. In fact, it took some of the old students to come around and introduce us to STEM. So I think that the issue of STEM education is one of interest and foreknowledge. Say it again. The, the issue of STEM education, mm -hmm. the low rate of STEM education in universities, mm -hmm. is because of interest and foreknowledge. People don't know that these things are there. So I, for personally, I think that um, in your study, if you could look at high school before uh, universities, that would do a great deal. Because the students will move from high school and get to the university. So when they have so much interest in STEM, so much knowledge in STEM at the high school level, then when they get to the university, it is easier. Um, one of the things I wanted to say is that maybe in the course of your work, you may also look, want to look at getting people in STEM to get to policy decision-making um, um, positions. Currently, Ghana, we have an education minister who is into STEM. In fact, he was in the U.S. He had a school here. He was operating a school, and he came down to Ghana. And now he's trying to develop STEM, STEM schools in the high school level in Ghana and we are drafting curriculums to help that. So if you could target high school level and look at how do we get science people also into policy decision making, I think it would do a great deal to enhance uh, the work you are doing. Thank you. Okay, one more question. Yes, Nancy. OK. 
Okay, thank Ms. you Riley. so much. Uh, my name is Nancy. Uh, I'm a scholar as well. And uh, my question is to Dr. Justine. I heard you mention so many strategies that you're using, and uh, one of them is uh, approaching the parliamentarians. So I was just curious, what is the strategy? Like, how are you going to do that? Because it's easier said than done. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we start with uh, Joseph this time. Okay, so um, indeed we are aware that there are other factors that influence uh, women getting into the, the health facility. Um, Liberia, um, post-conflict Liberia did identify um, geographic access as a main constraint. And as such, uh, they look at, uh, as they define access as those communities that are within less than five kilometers from a health facility or one hour's work. So those are factors that, that could also constrain uh, the person getting into the health facility once the decision is, is made. And we know those are factors also to be considered. Also road conditions, even the availability of ambulances. We are trying to capture those um, um, variables also to try to ascertain as to what, to what extent they also influence maternal and neonatal outcome. Thank you. Justin? Okay, uh, thank you. I'm okay with you, Samuel, concerning the, the fact that people need to be synthesized when they are still in higher education. There are some work, there are maybe work, or maybe there is a tendency that people are trying to teach students from primary school to secondary school to, like, to embrace the STEM field. And there are some campaign usually uh, that people are doing towards this area. That's really good. We can maybe consider some data from that to strengthen the work. But actually, concerning um, encourage policymakers to have people from background STEM. In Cameroon, many ministries has like uh, the, the main, the, how can I say, the technical advice, advice of ministry usually come from STEM from Ministry of Higher Education, Secondary Education, or, or Research. But things are not moving, maybe because they don't have the real information. Because to be able to, 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 like, to improve a decision, you need to understand what is going, you, have to, you need to have some scientific evidence to be able to support that. And also, what is a, a science expert can do is just a proposal. So you are not changing the law. We are just expecting that it could change because policymaker has another agenda. It's, they are influenced by maybe political something, cultural or international law. So that sometimes you are not aware of. So you just try to help them to improve their decision by saying these are some scientific facts. If you, the, if you invest here, it will be better to attend this. So up to you to see uh, if you adopt it or not. So uh, that's it. Um, yeah, the last point from Nancy, uh, like workshop with parliamentarian, actually. So in 2019, the Cameroon Academy of Young Scientists organized a workshop on science advice. I'm a part of the network, uh, of international network of government science advice. I'm a member of the steering committee in, of the Africa chapter. So we organized workshop on science advice over the continent in Africa. So in 2019 in Cameroon, we organized a workshop on science advice to the government. And then the second part was toward parliamentarian of South Africa region. So we are working on this project like more than one year and a half already. We have focal point in different uh, country in, in Central Africa. And then I was, I was saying the, the project is going, is, is on the good road because uh, we have people who accept to fund the event already, but some parliamentarians are already uh, like okay with the event, the president of like National Assembly are okay in the sub, you just need to like let the things go. 
So what is lacking to make it successful is just the case study from this study who will be studied during the workshop. So it's something that is already in the mood. It's not like you are just dreaming, actually. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. So let's take uh, the last set of questions. So, so we, we, have, have we have one question asker on Zoom. Let's see if we can get that person to speak. If that doesn't work, then we'll ask him to type his question. And then I know you also had a question. Let's first see if we can get our Zoom person. Uh, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay, good to see you guys. I'm uh, one of the previous cohorts, I mean 2021 cohort. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Pierre Kalengam Gay. So I've been there from, uh, uh, from February until uh, end of June. So it's good to see you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I cannot uh, recall your name, sorry, but I will just try to give the question according to what I heard from uh, each of you. Uh, one, it's about uh, the uh, pregnant people getting uh, help uh, support. And you mentioned something about uh, the WhatsApp uh, usage. And, uh, I, I think I found it difficult to understand why WhatsApp, because we know that uh, WhatsApp will, be, will uh, require a lot of data which will require for someone to have a specific type of phone. And then uh, beside that, uh, we also have the story about connectivities and what. Did you take all those uh, issues into consideration when you did your studies? That's uh, my simple question for that, uh, uh, for that speaker. The next question is about um, uh, domestic, domestic workers in South Africa. Um, so uh, if you, uh, with uh, the details that you mentioned there, um, uh, I find it a bit difficult to, to see how you can collect the data and uh, put them together to make a specific trend that you try to show, that, to show us. The reason is what? Uh, most of the time, domestic workers and uh, the patron or the boss, they, it's just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, commitment or one-on-one -on -one, uh, agreement. So how is it, uh, how easy is it, uh, can it be for you to kind of uh, say whatever that you want to bring into consider consideration to be implemented can work properly, whereas you're dealing with uh, things that uh, can be happening almost confidentially. I don't know if you read my question there. Yeah, sure. Is that all? Okay, that, 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 uh, that, those are my two questions. Thank uh, you and right. uh, good to see you again. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, Broadway. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yes. Yeah, it's on. Okay, my name is Rodwell Makombe, also a UMAP scholar. Uh, I have a few questions. The first one is for Joseph. I'm not sure how the Liberian context looks like in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the settlements of people. If you are going to use WhatsApp, I, I, I'm, I want to understand how the referral system itself is going to work. Uh, the people staying in, in, a, in, like in, a, in a township in one place, if a woman is pregnant somewhere, who are you? Who is going to refer her? Does she have a phone herself to be able to WhatsApp, or you assume that someone is going to know that she has a problem and then they are going to refer her? I just want an explanation in terms of the the, the way in which the system actually works. Uh, the second one is to do with the the infrastructure and and the resources in the hospitals. You seem to make an assumption that the problem is actually that these women can't get to the hospitals quick, early enough, and that's what you want to address. But from my knowledge of what's going on, what goes on in Africa, if they get there, are they going to get the help? Uh, how are the facilities like? You know, that's another question. Uh, then the last one is to do with the bands. I, I was thinking about the issue of putting a red band on someone who is very sick. Uh, doesn't that affect them psychologically? Have you thought mm -hmm. about that? To actually say, it was red, we all know, it means someone is going to die, perhaps. <laughs> uh, then the last one, uh, not the last, oh, yes, the last one is for Justine. Is there no history to this? Uh, because I know that in other countries, like South Africa, for example, there is a deliberate attempt to address the historical you know, challenges. And I think the STEM issue is a historical issue in Africa. Is, is Cameroon consciously trying to address that as a historical issue to say there was a particular point where black people would not be allowed to do STEM subjects. 
and and that could be one of the reasons why you know you don't have many people doing STEM. Is there a deliberate effort to actually see that as a problem and probably put a lot of funding into STEM education? All right, thank you. We're almost out of time, so about uh, 45 seconds each to respond to the questions. I'll start with uh, Anna. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I got the question correct in terms of how I'll be able to collect my data uh, with mm -hmm. the domestic workers. Well, I'm going to use agents, and I think I've mentioned one of the union on the slide that is actually representing domestic workers in South Africa. So I'm going to use um, 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 their list of potential domestic workers who are listed with them, and, um, and, and also their agents who are actually have um, who actually uh, is actually that part of their job to actually locate domestic workers who come from Lesotho into South Africa, and there are also South African households that are particularly lo looking for domestic workers who are from Lesotho and not from any other African country. Um, and also potentially visit areas where domestic workers do gather. Uh, like I mentioned, the Sheila Day. Sheila Day was normally a Thursday, and they would gather at, at parks, you know, uh, at, during their lunch break or, 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 some, or something like that. And, um, and they also have a form of, um, I would say, it's a, actually South African a term, like sort of like a, a society of them where they normally contribute uh, certain like monthly contributions so that they can be able to um, have some sort of financial uh, support amongst themselves as a community of domestic workers. And um, I think there was a, a question regarding, um, I think the, 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 the question was also resonating regarding the type of questions that I'll be using. So I'll be using questionnaires, which I'm not actually at liberty now to disclose. Uh, them at the moment, but basically, I think that, that he was asking whether or not if they can be able to, um, how they be able to express themselves when I interview them, if they'll be working um, in those particular households. But obviously, that I would allow them to actually indicate um, their experiences being domestic workers um, within those households, and if the, I pick up certain elements that resonate to my research project. I will obviously um, ensure that it's, it's, it's well uh, narrated and directed to regarding my research. All right, thank you. Justin? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's possible that, that uh, the history has something to do with the low participation in STEM education. And I can mention also the ignorance of maybe, uh, I can't say the leaders, but the ignorance of the system which didn't have a complete understanding of the importance of STEM. For example, in US, they say that like physics contribute, maybe I don't know, it's 4%, I don't have the clear of the DGP. Is DGP? GDP, exactly. So, and uh, by doing that, you will realize that sometime in some Africa, in Cameroon that I know better, uh, many people don't choose the some like field like physics, mathematics, because they don't have a good understanding in, on what career, uh, what is the career after math and physics. And also, those who have the understanding, or maybe more understanding, do not translate it very well, and they make it a lot, very complex to understand. We see math like something physically, things with a lot of like, like, uh, like number and something, sometimes it's kind of broken. So I think if people are less ignorant, and also the political wills, who can be more open to know that they have to invest in STEM. In the past, I think some organization was telling to Africa country to invest more on primary education. In Cameroon, primary education is free. And for example, here in US on some developed country, they are investing in higher education because the manpower for the development is mostly in higher education. So I think they need a shift of paradigm, like be less ignorant and may, maybe more political will to be able to embrace the STEM, knowing that to be like to be emergent, they absolutely need to invest in STEM. That's all I can say. All right, thank you, Joseph. So the first question was um, about um, internet connectivity and data. Currently, for the pilot study we are providing. Uh, data for the uh, participants in the project areas 
and we only selected 20 rural health facilities that have internet connectivity, so we are aware. But um, the providers are using their own smartphones, so that was the prerequisite for, for enrollment into the, the program. If you have a smartphone, the only thing we do, we provide monthly data package for you to use. One of the challenges that, um, even from my own experience before this research, was that feedback communication has been a challenge. So what we are also providing through the WhatsApp platform is for people who do referrals to also get feedback from the referring facility, the referral facilities, uh, because uh, the challenge is that from the community, referral is done to the primary facility, then to the district hospital. But then the people don't get feedback. What has become of the patient? We are providing them this platform to provide that feedback. And to your question, Rodwell, the referral system is a three-tier system, right? We have the community the health facility, and the district hospital. So people live in different communities, but within those communities, they have community health assistants. These are volunteers from the community to whom, if you have any problem, you are supposed to report. Then they now, with, through their assessment, their initial assessment, will alert the health facility. And the health facility, if they can't handle it, they were sent to the district. So the assumptions that we are operating on is that there was a policy pivot from discouraging trained traditional midwives from providing delivery services in the community to referral. And what we notice is that from 2017 up to 2020, Facility-based delivery by skilled attendants rose from 37% to 83. So a lot of deliveries are happening, but yet maternal deaths are still occurring at the facilities. The three delays are generally, have generally proven to be the major causes, right? So in our own way, we're trying to see how we can reduce wait times. If the facility is not uh, a crowded facility, then triaging will not make any difference because it will be on a first come, first serve basis. But if the facility is packed, then you cannot do first come, first serve. You have to prioritize the most critical. And the experience we have with these bins is not only with pregnant women. women. We also use that classification to assess malnourished children. And from my experience, there has never been any or uh, dread for reaction to the coloration. It only tells the other people that this person's condition is very serious. That's the reason why we are seeing them first. And the evidence is on the band that we're giving them. It's not because they gave us anything that why we are seeing them first. So it also provides evidence as to the reason for prioritizing that classification. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's put our hands together for our panelists. Soon to be Dr. Anna Mohagi, <laughs> Dr. Justin Zundi, and Dr. Joseph Sieka. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you at the next uh, event, which we're gonna be announcing soon on our website, and please join us again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And for everybody here, there's <laughs> coffee and snacks around the corner. Came a bit late, but it's there now. <laughs>